I'm Raphael. I'm Lauren. We're the Pacheco siblings, and welcome to the Hypercube Podcast, a talk show in which two siblings converse about anything and everything. So we were just talking before we fired up the recording about, well, well about recording. About recording. That is true. That is very true. Um, because you were worried about, uh, we were recording in the same room in the same environment for the time being, which is really cool to be able to do. Oh, absolutely. Like you I can look at you. And it's oh great. yeah. We won't be able to do this forever. And that's what makes it extra cool because we will not always be in the same space, uh, especially in the foreseeable future. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. And you were worried about, uh, bleeding into each other's, uh, recordings, which is solely a thing. But once we have it all synchronized, uh, for post-production, it actually isn't that noticeable, which I was explaining makes a lot of sense because this is the way that a lot of people have recorded for most of history. Yeah, like this is just what you used to have to do. Yeah, because nobody had Discord in the 40s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was remote recording? Um, but yeah, well, like it's weird to think about, but pretty much all music before a certain point was recorded in this fashion. Yeah. We have a big band in a room in the same space, Mm -hmm. all recording each of their individual parts mic'd up, but they would obviously bleed into each other's audio. Yeah. Uh, And that's, that's just the way it was. Um, But you don't notice that as a, you know, huge destruction to the sound quality. And that's the thing as uh, what I was about to explain to you, which we are now rolling for (laughs) is how is EQ because audio engineering is something I've been doing a, a little bit more of lately. I've been trying to brush up. I did a, 12 week course back uh in last year Mm -hmm. which was going on about the same time that i was doing post-production on beyond so that was pretty cool i got to apply some of the skills i learned there oh yeah it's really really good stuff too oh yeah yeah beyond is hands down the best sound work i've ever done the thing about eq is that it does address some of those stuff uh for example if you have bleed between uh different sources you know that are in the same room because of the fact that the sound is a little bit more distant Right. I explained to you about how lower frequencies uh, work, right? You hear them reverberating through a wall because in the way the reason somebody sounds muffled when you're listening to them on the other side of a wall Mm -hmm. is because you're only hearing the lower end frequencies and the lower end frequencies naturally tend to sound kind of muffled. But however, with a wall in the way, those higher end frequencies get blocked. They don't have as much pushing, piercing power, if you will. Yeah, they just get absorbed by the wall. Whereas the lower end frequencies can basically ignore the wall and go Mm -hmm. right through it to a certain extent. Yeah. And that's why you only hear low end frequencies, which sound to our ears Mm -hmm. as kind of muffled when you're listening to someone through a wall or through a door or something like that. And it's the same thing with just having a little bit of distance, right? Obviously, the amount that uh, someone in the background will appear in another's recording is fairly low. So they're already low in volume, right? They don't create a huge waveform. I'm looking at your waveform right now. Oh, yeah. Which my voice carries a bit. So I'd imagine it it's it, noticeable, it, but it's not gigantic. Yeah, I can see gigantic. you. I can see you on my waveform uh, that I have in front of me right now. Like, it's significantly smaller than my waveforms, but you're still there. You look like you're speaking into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I tend to have pretty good projection, I suppose. Yeah. But I need to work on my projection. Probably, probably. I could definitely tell that you're not using the full extent of your uh, uh, lung capacity. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but that's a that's a I'm story gonna, for another. I'm going to start. Try, I'm going to start trying to project a little more often because I know how to. I just don't do it. I'm not. I'm not in the practice of projecting. Yeah, I guess having done a little bit more oration, uh, I'm a little bit more rehearsed at using yeah. those skills and flexing those literal muscles. Um, not as a manner of speaking, but literally flexing yeah. those muscles. That's all besides the point, though. I, I am planning to train you more on that because yeah. I've been I've been doing that for some uh, for, <laughs> for some of our close circle more recently, or at least been trying to. But anyway, the, the, not only is that lower in volume, right? So you have a smaller amplitude on the waveform mm-hmm. of somebody in the background. But because of the fact, like if you were to listen to that back, it wouldn't just be that they're quieter. They would sound a little bit more distant. And what that is, is a frequency uh, response, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the way you're hearing those uh sort of lower end not as lower end as like hitting a wall but like yeah. slightly lower end frequency just traveling through air yeah and a lot of noise and stuff for example is a lot of like really lower end or higher end frequencies uh, they're usually in one of the extremes like just ambient kind of noise which is why just doing a uh high uh 
Is it high pass? High, low pass? One of those filters. One of the passes. Just doing one of the... <laughs> I, I always get it mixed up mixed up because it's like, how does it... Is it... Do you cut off above or below? Well, actually, I think it's both for depending on whether you're doing high or low frequencies. But my point is you do one of these, you know, pass filters uh, right off the bat. One of the reasons you usually do that for just about any EQ is because that cuts off the little noise frequencies that generate a little bit of... Uh, volume in your recording but aren't necessarily audible right they're not really in the right. audible range but they're still there and they're still contributing to like just like muddiness yeah basically like they're, they're not perceptible to the human ear but they're still contributing to your readout on what your volume levels are looking uh -huh. at and so just cutting those out is just like okay now i'm seeing a more accurate readout of what the sound right. that people are hearing is so that way you can more accurately edit to uh, edit the sound waves that you're actually gonna be able to hear as opposed to what is what was picked up that you won't be able to hear exactly uh, yeah because our audio recording devices it turns out are very uh correct uh, correct me on the terminology you're always uh correct on this one is it precise or accurate <laughs> uh precise so okay precise versus they pick accurate. up everything yeah Pre uh accurate means so they're often used interchangeably because for most things they mean the same thing mm -hmm. but for scientific uh precision uh they do actually have different definitions accuracy just means you get close to the right answer most of the time precision means you get the same answer every time if you are both accurate and precise you get the right answer every time <laughs> but you can be precise and get the wrong answer every time right so precise is like the grouping precision yeah. is the grouping of the spread yeah so, so, whereas so accuracy wanna... is having the spread in the right place exactly so uh if you want to think the spread of it, on target if you want to think of it like like if you if data as a Gatling gun pointed at a, <laughs> at, at a target, precision is how close the shots are together. Accuracy is how close to the bullseye it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got or it. Got how it. close to wherever you were aiming was. Cause you can. So would that be precision be or accuracy for what I'm trying Preci to describe? So pre that would be, that would be precision of getting everything. So like it, it is, uh, well, I guess it's not really, yeah, this isn't really precise. This is just catching everything. It, that sounds, it that yeah. sounds like accurate to me. Like it's capturing literally what's happening in yeah. its environment. So, uh, and the, well, that's the thing with any kind of recording, right? Like a uh, video recording, uh, film right. recording, anything like that. You're literally capturing raw information mm -hmm. and that information doesn't lie. So it's capturing everything that's in that environment, including stuff you don't necessarily want or need. Yeah. So there's a lot, it turns out there's a lot of sound just bouncing around ambiently in your environment and you could use treatment processes to mitigate that. However, that's just there. They're just yeah. frequencies that are out there that you don't necessarily need. But anyway, so that's a little discussion yeah, so, that I wanted so to open on. Here. So you basically just cut out everything out of the low end. I was wondering if there's something for audio that you could get uh, that you get in like something I would have for photography um, is to just like have two different versions of say or say I have my audio track under your audio track. Right. And you could just like subtract your waveforms from mine. I'm sure there is a way. I do not know it. Okay. <laughs> that, is, that is beyond me. But what you're Basically essentially just talking about is using like... Using like a mask or something. Yeah. Like using your... Because I want to cut your voice out of my WAV file. Can I just take your thing as a sample and just like eliminate that as noise from mine? Yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm sure that is possible. That sounds very doable. However, that is beyond my capabilities because essentially what you're describing is noise canceling, right? Yeah. That's the same sort of tech that's so used in noise canceling headphones. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, which means because it could be done in real time on a device like a noise canceling headphone, I'd assume it would also be pretty easy to do in not real time in a full post production right. suite. You just don't know the the buttons. Yeah, I just not, yeah, I yeah. just don't know okay. the the methodologies. But that should no doubt be theoretically a uh, simple thing to do, yeah. or at least a possible thing to do. <laughs> no, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh, sound, really quick, do you know what sound? is like literally <laughs> yeah like literally in the physical world that we exist in well what is sound there well sound is just energy carried through a medium like air mm -hmm. but how is that energy transferred like light is particles that that carry energy and we perceive that through our eyeballs oh sound um, is vibrations which is movement exactly sound is movement ah <laughs> yeah. every time you move you technically create 
sound. So like if you even if to, it's not audible, even if it's not audible, because it's on the order of like if you're walking through a room, you create a wave that is like one hertz. <laughs> one, like one hurt like it is one pass. one hurt <laughs> one hurt a singular hurt right so like that sounds walk- like a metric you need in boxing or something like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm gonna deliver one hurt to his face yeah uh but that's why like uh there is why that's why there's so much there is so much sound just ambiently is because as we move and things just exist and things move like because you know we're not no, there is no place that is sitting at absolute zero there is always going to be movement uh, that's not true. What about in the vacuum of space? There is also movement. Ah! <laughs> You're blowing <laughs> just, my mind right now. But it is a uh, fun fact. The vacuum of space is not a perfect vacuum. There are still Wait, air really? and mar- yeah, there are still errant molecules that are flying around, as well as uh, just things in it. Um, there are. You're telling me there's plenty of stuff out in space. There's, there's plenty of stuff out in space. It's just there's a lot more gaps between them, bigger gaps. So like between individual molecules, there'll be like gaps the size of who knows how how big, as opposed to when you're in an atmosphere. The gaps between molecules are significantly smaller, right? <laughs> uh, because there's always something yeah. around you. We're, we're, we measure it in uh, parts per million, right? Or as in space, you might measure it in like parts per mile. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know exactly how the, how that goes. But uh, yeah, all sound is is our brain uh, using like using a membrane, our ears, right? Uh, the same right. thing that would be used for a microphone or anything like that to detect how pressure changes in our environment and we ter- we detect that as sound a certain pressure changes are just completely in unusable to us for if you just have like one big or not big because that's an explosion that would rupture our eardrums like if you had one small pass of air past us somebody walking by uh we don't detect that as sound we, 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 we can't like detect like pressure right you can feel the wind yeah but like also, my everything is making sound, and love, uh, and as the things vibrate and move around, we detect that as noise mostly, as not uh, sounds that doesn't have any like you know, any frequency that is uh, that harmonizes with itself or anything like that. But uh, voices or things above a certain frequency that will start to have harmony or, or like a harmonic nature, bouncing off walls in, in right. the environment. That's the stuff that our brain goes, oh. That's something I need to pay attention to and converts it into sound. Mm-hmm. But all it is, is things vibrating and moving in our environment. Yeah, which is interesting because, yeah, that's the thing. We, we, there are only so many frequencies that are audible to the human ear. And some frequencies are more audible than others, which is one of the things that you kind yeah. of focus on in, in, in mixing. However, like all frequencies in the audible range will have some sort of emotional effect on somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, but some are more audible than others. For example, in the presence frequencies, especially higher frequencies, for example, presence and sibilance and things like that, those are very, very present to our ears, hence the name for presence, as uh, that's, that's kind of nicknamed. And so boosting those for something stuff like we notice. Yeah, exactly. So boosting those in things like voiceover tends to bring more clarity or at least more um, perceived volume, even if there's no actual increase in volume just because our brain hallucinates that being more important exactly our brain will hallucinate that being more important because that's just the way it works like our we like those frequencies and we see that as being higher in priority probably because voices tend to you know lie in that range if you were to hear them in person right um but they so those tend to rest above uh the noise so like if you're in a mix and you'll see this a lot if you analyze any like mix for a film or anything like that how different things are prioritized because a thing most people perhaps don't always notice consciously at least is that dialogue is usually not mixed very loudly in films Mm -hmm. it tends to be mixed actually pretty low in order to give it a bit more of a naturalistic feel i suppose Mm -hmm. you don't want someone shouting in your i guess yeah like just like one plus you need you need room to go up uh, yeah that's also true if you know for the performance as well yeah so that if somebody does start to yell it has somewhere to go without peaking yeah and then that's when you that's when it starts sounding loud Mm -hmm. but the thing is usually you can still hear the dialogue clearly yeah and the reason for that is because it's been eq'd to so that the those presence frequencies can uh, rise above the rest of the noise so even if you have a sort of soundscape with a bunch of competing noise that's at the same volume as that voice Mm -hmm. as long as you've eq'd it the way you would most vocals uh to have more presence it will sound we'll be able to perceive it more perceive it more clearly and obviously this is used in music a lot too Uh, which is where the real mixing work is done (laughs) but that's not an industry i know very well 
I wonder then if that's a feature of the human brain or if that's just a, a brain thing, like uh, things that can perceive sound will perceive that in the same way. Like, I wonder if a dog hmm. hearing its owner's voice in like a movie would recognize that as their owner. That's a fair point. Because I wonder if it just if there's just so much competing noise, if everything's at the, at the same volume, I wonder if that dog can pinpoint and say like, ah, I can hear my owner in all that noise and will, you know, react to it. Yeah. Or it's just like, there was some stuff going on. I don't know what's going on. It's all the same. It's all the same volume. Well, that's the interesting thing. I've often wondered. <laughs> this is such a nerdy thing to wonder about. <laughs> but I've often wondered what the subjective experience of a household pet like a dog would be to the sound mixes that we regularly yeah, right, listen yeah, to, right? Yeah. Because they clearly hear it. They react to it yeah. sometimes. I've heard our dog Jacob bark at dogs uh, that have appeared in films every yeah. uh, once in a while. He so, usually just ignores them. But so, yeah, some, some I've, I have seen uh, many a video on Twitter of oh, yeah. Zootopia starting a howl. <laughs> oh, yeah. Zootopia d d is prone to starting actual howls. So... Yeah, that's the thing is I've often wondered what their subjective experience is, though, because even though they're hearing the exact same noises, it's, it's the same they have, stimulation, it's the same stimulation. The same thing is happening in physical space when those uh, sound waves are moving towards them. However, their ears and their senses just have a higher, a much higher frequency yeah. range than ours. And also and also they're they're more adapted to hearing certain things like their ears are shaped in a different way right so it's like their subjective experience is going to be way different from ours yeah but that's what i'm wondering is how much <laughs> like, like based on the way we mix things like how how much different is it yeah. right because we cut out again a lot of the frequencies that we don't tend to use so it's like will they actually have a generally similar experience just because all those frequencies that they hear outside of our ranges just, just aren't they just aren't there on yeah. on a, a film sound mix. It's just like ah, oh, like this this thing that you're playing on this light box is sounding very muddy. <laughs> yeah, like, but that and then that becomes the question because I suppose yeah they they would then notice the absence of those yeah. frequencies Cause we're, surely. Because like we humans like we can't hear it. We'll just get rid of it. And then, dogs just like this just, sounds unnatural. Yeah, dogs going like where'd the rest of it go? <laughs> Yeah, and maybe that's why they don't react to it 100% yeah, of the time yeah. is because there's a certain degree to which they can tell it's fake because there are, there are just frequency yeah. ranges that are missing. And that's the thing, like, the pets have, have uh, been shown to, like, react differently to, like, to anything, like music or yeah. movies or, any, like, stuff like that. Uh, their own reflection? Like, <laughs> different, well, different pets will react differently. Like, some, some animals watch TV. Some don't. I wonder how that is affected by their own personal subjective experience like is it just some animals can look at it and go like okay that is fake i'm gonna ignore it or and some are just like okay that is fake and i'm going to like and i'm curious i want to know what that is or is it just or is it like some animals are just so dumb they're like something's happening i just want to pay attention <laughs> <laughs> there is some stimulation going on and i just want to be there for it yeah yeah like if i wonder like which way it swings is it just like because they obviously it's going to be completely different experience mm -hmm. but i wonder why certain animals are more drawn to media uh and others are just completely over it and they don't really care it, they just they won't interact with tv music or anything like that yeah i wonder if it's just the personality thing yeah well well, we'll add that to the list of guests that we need to have on is <laughs> yeah. a, a animal behavioral scientist of some sort that can explain this to us. <laughs> you scientist, what is happening in this dog's brain? <laughs> can you tell me, please? Uh, yeah, I would love to have proper uh, oh, that would people be from the science field. Yeah. Guesting on Experts this podcast in any field is an excellent time to just like what's like, just tell me, please. Yeah. First, we need to see if we could uh, find listeners. <laughs> that would be great. Hey, Nobody you. would want to be on a podcast that doesn't have listeners. And as of this recording, no episode of this podcast is yet to air. That's so <laughs> we have zero listeners. But as of this publishing, you are a listener. That is true. You're Assuming you exist. You because we could still have zero <laughs> listeners. But <laughs> if anybody did listen to it, we would be a listener. Yes. But that's the point. This is a rather existential point. This is, you well, don't, this is, you this don't, is, this is, this is, this is the, uh, if a tree falls in the woods. This is if a tree falls in the woods, which is the natural question that emerges from the exact conversation we were just <laughs> having. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it, the tree falling in the woods and it's also 
Schrodinger in there somewhere. Somewhere in there. Schrodinger's yeah. podcast, <laughs> which is a great name for a podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> There's got to be one of those out there somewhere, right? A Probably. Schrodinger's podcast. But what That's would too even, good of a name. What would the co- concept be? Well, I think the, it would. The podcast both uh, mm. exists and doesn't exist until you listen to it. I'm not sure. It, 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 if okay, depending on the direction you want to go, a Schrodinger's podcast could be uh, a narrative podcast. Uh, oh, with a story. With a story that is existential in nature. Some that, that has some kind of uh, probably some kind of like audience participation. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. Pitch yeah, me on this. Maybe I don't know. I'm trying to. Th- I'm trying to think of how that is. How exactly that could work? Because the podcast. All right. Well, you you sit on that one. Maybe we'll come back to it in the okay. next episode. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By the by, next episode I will pitch you Schrodinger's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have a podcast pitch within a podcast. Brilliant. Yeah. I love it. And we're, I don't know if we should do that. We're giving away some free material. I know this does sound like free material, but well, didn't we? We have tossed around the idea of just doing a pitch deck show. That is true. Because I mean, th- well, yeah, that's, ideas. Yeah, that's the nature of ideas, which is what's interesting. I find listening to people like, say, the Green Brothers. Yeah. Another pair of brothers that we really admire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> talk about their exchange of ideas. And it's interesting listening to that and being like, oh, wow, that's just this is just the thing that other people do as well. Yeah. But, but we are in a way con- more professional about it. They're way more professional. But, well, they also have a lot more resources yeah. and they've been uh, they have ability to change the world around them to yeah. a far greater extent to than we do. Change who affect change. That's a very technical term it is. nowadays. It is. <laughs> um, however, we are in a constant exchange of ideas, you yes. and I. And like basically any time we talk yeah. to each other, we have some sort of exchange of ideas. And that's where this podcast was basically born. Essentially, was, we just we're just taking our exchange of ideas and hopefully monetizing it <laughs> recording it at the very yeah, least recording it and turning it into like turning it into content turning it into content because yeah. we give away way too much content into the void of just like you know this conversation would probably be pretty interesting to at least one other person on this planet right. if we recorded it <laughs> however we're in a constant exchange of ideas and we are constantly pitching each other things and i think this is just an aspect of the creative life that not a lot of people emphasize mm-hmm. because Too many people emphasize the importance of ideas. Maybe not necessarily emphasize it, but in their head, ideas are pretty high in the hierarchy of what you need as an artist. And what I really appreciate is artists who tear down that myth and talk about the fact that ideas are kind of cheap, which they are. Yeah. Because once you start doing what we've made a habit of doing, of just constantly pitching each other ideas for shows, movies, things like that, or even just pitching each other fixes for shows or movies we've seen right where it's just like hmm that wasn't that great yeah like a question i'll often ask you when you make a critique about a story we just engaged with is okay but how would you fix it and that always leads to interesting conversation yeah so the thing is once you get into the habit of doing stuff like that though of constantly exchanging ideas or developing ideas or uh, building upon other people's ideas you'll come to find that yeah ideas are kind of cheap like you can have so many of them so often and i think it was maya angelo who once said like creativity is not i'm paraphrasing here not a limited resource yeah the, the more of it you use the more of it you have in fact yeah. so and that is 100 percent true Absolutely. right if you get in these habits these creative habits of generating ideas you will never have a shortage of ideas because you will come to find that you could essentially constantly yeah. produce ideas. So it, having it, a big idea isn't ne- what you need to look for, especially in today's world where most ideas have already been done. What you need is and execution. And the thing about and ideas too is like, if I, okay, let me, let me just pose this question really quick then. Mm-hmm. If ideas were as valuable, uh, as uh what what would i say um independently valuable like a single idea has value right mm-hmm. as opposed to the idea of having ideas <laughs> which is more valuable we're getting very meta here i apologize if we're losing <laughs> audience members in this conversation but i'm following yeah yeah I'm here for so it. uh a single idea is valuable in and of itself right mm-hmm. the idea that like i have this one thing it's valuable i want to create that and make it perfect right right um if that were true why do pitch or or, or why do uh prompt generators exist yeah <laughs> right like that's literally free ideas you click it and you just go <laughs> click 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 and you've generated like 10 things that theoretically have infinite value yeah it's like that's not that doesn't work like that like the it's 
the, not the individual idea that has value. It's creating the idea that has value. That, that, mm. That's where and, it and it's the practice of creating yeah. the idea that has value, right? Because it's not just the process of it. It's the practice of it. It's and, what exercising that muscle is doing to your brain yeah. that and has not, value. And not only creating, but filtering. Because not every idea is a good one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you, and, that's, and that's one of the problems when it comes to latching on to a single idea is like, if, if that was the one good idea you have, you don't know if it's good until you finish it. So if you latch onto it and you continue to work on it over and over and over again, like reiterating on this idea, until you finish that idea and have another one, you can't tell whether that idea was actually a good one to have latched onto. You have to create several ideas, boil it down to the one that is the one that, okay, this survived whatever process I have for, to filter out ideas, which means it's better than the other ones. And that's the one that you, I can then finish. Oh, yeah. But if you just have the one idea without it, like just in a void, no filter, you have, there is no you have no guarantee that that's even a good idea to, to like to begin with. Yeah, exactly. You need a methodology for yeah. sifting through your not ideas. All, not all ideas are created equal. Mm -hmm. There are some pretty bad ideas out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't be reliant on your one big idea. And I remember uh, there's this one writing quote. I can't remember who to attribute this one to. But where they say uh, attribute it to yourself. Well, I'll give you my version. They say, uh, don't trust an idea until it survived the hangover. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that's yeah, I, I don't drink, but I think that's such a practical piece of advice. <laughs> um, and I think my version of it, the version of it that I've employed for myself as a non drinker <laughs> is. Don't trust an idea until at least the next day. Yeah. Right. Don't get excited about. Well, it's a good to get excited about an idea, but don't latch on to it unless. It's you wake up the next morning and are still thinking about it and are still excited about and are it. still excited yeah. about it. Yeah, that's for me is the first litmus test for eliminating an idea. Like I could just eliminate an idea wholesale if it doesn't even last till the next morning. What right? or if, And if it, if it lasts the next week and I'm still thinking about it, then it's just like, OK, I probably ought to write this down in yeah. greater detail. One of the things because uh, I don't have that great a memory. Uh, that, <laughs> one of the things that I've uh, used and, and I, people tell me I have great memory listener. Uh, your mileage may vary, but get yourself a raft. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you so many ideas. And the ones a year later, you say, hey, what happened to that one idea? That was a good idea. I go, tell me it again, because I forgot. <laughs> and, then you, and then you explain it to me. I'm like, that is a good idea. Maybe I'll write it now. <laughs> yeah, it is true. I'm like your personal recorder. Yeah. Because you'll send me or tell me so many ideas yeah and here's the thing about lauren <laughs> maybe most people don't realize because well we're told we're very similar in a lot of ways people have mistaken us for twins i'm not sure how that i don't happens. understand how that happens me neither like we look nothing alike but i think it's just the personality thing yeah. right it's just that we are on such a similar frequency and wavelength that uh, people see that dynamic and think it's like oh wow they're really tight-knit yeah um However, we are also polar opposites in a lot of ways. And I think that's w the way we kind of operate is we balance each other out. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things well, we specialize. We, yeah, that's true. We do specialize. Um, and we have a, a lot of overlap, but we also specialize. Yeah. But one of the things I've always sort of naturally had, I suppose, is pretty good semantic memory. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Lauren has always kind of had that most people not, <laughs> might not realize is not necessarily a very short term memory. But a very selective, selective. memory. I, I have trained myself to filter my memory to only, to only the things that I necessary like that are necessary to my survival. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, that's not entirely true. I know some really really dumb pieces of trivia. <laughs> but, it's true. Um, I uh, I do actually have a. I don't know how conscious it is because like uh, selectively pruning your memory is something that is possible right but i'm not sure i haven't taken any like formal classes so mm -hmm. what i have is you're not trained in memory yeah, pruning i'm not i'm not it's not something that i have any formal training and it's something that i've developed over time to just kind of just as a habit yeah make my learning uh process more efficient because i learn a lot I, like, or you we, absorb we, a lot of information lot, yeah. you should say <laughs> i should say I, sh I should say i i subject myself to a lot of information <laughs> and i uh i have a process it's called it pseudo consciously about which things I can choose to remember and which things I choose to forget. Uh, a lot of things just pass me by. <laughs> oh yeah, which is which is totally a thing because well, it reminds me of you know in the BBC Sherlock show with Benedict Cumberbatch, right. which we're going to talk about him here in a second. But um, mm -hmm. in that Sherlock show, there's that part where 
Watson's freaking out because he doesn't know that the Earth revolves around the sun or something yeah, basic like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just like, how does this like super genius guy not know that the Earth revolves around the sun? And he, his whole justific Sherlock's whole justification is just like it's not relevant information. Yeah. So I just deleted it from the hard drive. Yeah. Like there, there is no scenario except for the one that he happened to be in. <laughs> like, so that, yeah, because there was a setup and payoff with that later. <laughs> like that doesn't change how I interact with the world around me. Mm -hmm. the, which I is, function exactly the same knowing that information or not, so it is not necessary information. Which is such a high-functioning sociopath thing it's to so say. It's so high-functioning to say. <laughs> like, um, I, I, thankfully, I'm not at that level. Yeah, yeah. But there's you, a you are of, a little sociopathic, but yeah. not quite. <laughs> I, well, I'm not... Um, it's not as much of a disability for me anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I've, I've become a little bit more socialized now. But uh, I was, when I was young, it was a problem. Oh, yeah, for sure. Maybe we'll say more about that later. But maybe it reminds me of that, though, right? Where it's yeah. just like that was uh, Sherlock, that version of Sherlock Holmes whole approach to it. And it's like you're very much the same way of mm -hmm. this kind of hard pragmatism of if you don't need the information, you can discard. It. Yeah. Like, and so your RAM is essentially optimized to be interesting <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> which i guess is uh really what the talent you bring to the table is in most of life is just to so. be interesting I, well you are you're the life of the party person you're the person am I? oh yeah. man you're the person who as soon as you enter the room the conversation starts so i'm oh, not sure I if like you noticed that. that oh I, 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 here's the thing raf i don't notice that because <laughs> i'm talking the whole way through <laughs> that's fair you don't notice it because you weren't there <laughs> i wasn't there i was i walked in and i was like oh we're, we're talking okay I, I can get a part of this conversation <laughs> yeah <laughs> not oh my goodness, i never thought about that but from your perspective like nothing changes <laughs> yeah like uh, i'm just going from one conversation to another <laughs> No, yeah, it's 100% uh, true. I'll, uh, very often, the conversation doesn't start till you enter the room. <laughs> <laughs> I've always got something to say. And no, yeah, you are, you are the life of the party person. Yeah, although um, I, was gonna, I was gonna say something about um, social, socialitism? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> you know, oh, you mean like being a socialite? Being, yeah, being a socialite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta trans <laughs> translate these Laurenisms <laughs> for our, our, our well, audience. What I mean is, uh, the the state of being a socialite yes yes <laughs> yeah uh, having that applied to a person uh i was gonna say something about it but i uh, uh, you think I you're a socialite oh no well i think so uh, like at your in your final form <laughs> you know at the peak of your career do you think you I are capable think, of the socialite profession i don't think i could be like a professional host or anything like that right only because i don't have the presentation skills for it that is um, true. You do yeah. need to have good diction and speaking abilities. Yes, I do not have good diction or speaking abilities. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're all right. I can speak English. <laughs> Mostly. Um, but no, I definitely would be... Um, like, I could host a party. Right. But I couldn't host an event. It's basically what Okay, I get what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm but yeah, so that's the thing is, I guess, tying it, this is the thing we have to do a bunch <laughs> yep. in our conversations is reverse back to what point did we divert on that tangent again? Right. Which what it was, was you were saying, get you a raft. And because I'm essentially like a recorder, basically, I'm the opposite. I have like very, uh, apparently very good semantic memory. Mm -hmm. I can remember facts, names, proper nouns, yep. and sometimes ideas that you pitch me Basically. very well and Raf uh, can recite the imdb i'm pretty sure <laughs> all of it <laughs> <laughs> all the parts that you're that that, that you've uh, encountered <laughs> yeah um so yeah i i essentially am like both a sounding board and a recorder because that is true yeah. i will oftentimes pitch you back to you ideas that you pitched me and have since forgotten about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and sometimes i think when i pitch it back to you not only do you get enthused about the idea again, because you're hearing it for the first time, <laughs> <laughs> essentially, but uh, sometimes that like in itself does the sounding board process yeah. where it elaborates on it a bit more through the way that I've filtered it yeah. in my memory. And then you get a version of it that's like a little bit more refined. Yeah. And then once I hear that new idea, I get to refine it once more through a fresh lens. Because you completely because forgot about it. <laughs> I completely forgot about the original idea that I had. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. For sure. For sure. Yeah, there are times when I'm, when, when Raph will just be like, hey, what happened to the idea? He'll tell, tell it to me. And I'll slowly start getting excited like, oh, wait, I think I remember this. Was this the one? No, it wasn't that one. Okay, was it? No, it wasn't that one either. Was it this one? Yeah, that was it. Ah, yeah. I remember that idea. <laughs> How'd it go again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. It's pandemonium if, yeah. to probably everybody outside of those conversations. It's, but we... It's like half sentences that are just like, they don't go anywhere. And then eventually oh, yeah. it's, we agree. <laughs> That's our shorthand, though. Yeah. You know, yeah, we have, yeah, we, we, we have can definitely, we can definitely speak. We, well, we, we speak a different language. Most siblings, I think, have a language. That's true. They that have they a just code. like, yeah, just from time. Like anybody you spend enough time with, you eventually develop a shorthand. Yeah. But especially with a sibling, you spend most of your life with them. Mm -hmm. Or at least yeah. a sizable chunk of your most yeah. formative yeah. years. Exactly. That's, that's, that's what I mean is most of the time growing up with uh, that person, you will have developed a kind of language that you can communicate with. Mm hmm. All right, well, we want to get to a segment before this episode is over. However, Indeed. before we get to that segment, I want to briefly talk about something very topical. Okay. Which is this last week, as of this recording, mm -hmm. I'm going to date it, uh, they announced the nominees for the 94th Academy Awards. Oh, right. Yes, which is an yes. industry of some relevance to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very minute relevance, <laughs> maybe, but... <laughs> it's tangential to what we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I wanted to kind of go over that a little bit. All right. Uh, now... Obviously, we have a lot of opinions about the Academy and about the Oscars and right. award season in general. Uh, for clarity, it's not actually important. <laughs> no, it's a popularity contest. Uh, it, it's a politics contest. Really. I guess that's true, too. It's it's a campaign. That's oh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So but it, I, I find it very interesting to keep track of this stuff just because a it's a way of kind of keeping touch with the sort of elites of this industry, yeah. right? And the seeing it's like, okay, what are the movies that filmmakers generally are paying attention to? And what are the movies that producers are paying attention to, yeah. most especially? And also, um, so it's a way of keeping touch, uh, keeping track of the sort of mindset of the elites within the industry. But it's also an interesting, because there's a certain, certain historical significance to it, right? So mm -hmm. you're seeing what movies are getting recognized and in what year and where you could kind of see the trends going. Yeah. You can, see, you can um, uh, like see the patterns. Yeah. You can see the kind of the patterns and you could also, and it's also just fun to just see what in the highest level of celebration is celebrating within the industry, you know, that yeah. I, that, that yeah. I'm kind of making my career in. So yeah, it's just, it's fun to keep track of. It's interesting. It's not ultimately important. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Some of my favorite movies of all time have like zero Oscar nominations, right? <laughs> right? Well, even more recently, like, and you could, you could complain about those, but it's another testament to the fact that it doesn't ultimately matter. It doesn't actually yeah. mean anything. Yeah. Uh, right? Like Sing Street doesn't have any Oscar nominations, I'm pretty sure. No. It's just like, that movie is so freaking phenomenal. It blows my mind how under the radar it yeah. went. And the, like, uh, I think, I believe it was uh, Matt Koval who made this. Um, well, he makes statements all the time. <laughs> he does make statements. He, he just says whatever's on his mind. But he was talking about uh, the Oscars at one point, uh, and people were just like complaining about how many Marvel movies were coming out or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, Which Marvel or, or, or movies was, don't tend to do good. I think, at the it was, Oscars, I think but... he was just talking about box office stuff. Right, right. Uh, and, and people were complaining like, why are there so many Marvel movies or superhero movies or right. like, I want, I want to see more movies. I want to see more movies in, uh, of different kinds. And he, and he was just like, yeah, go watch them. They're out there. Like, <laughs> You, those like the things that you're looking at at the top 20 of like the box office those aren't all the movies in the world yeah there are so many more movies like the best movie ever made is being made right now and you've never heard of it probably <laughs> <laughs> that's a no, that's a bold statement what i mean to say is the best movie for you is either being made has already been made and you've never heard of it because there are hundreds of thousands of movies that it just that just happen and probably more than that and <laughs> no one sees most of them yeah. Simply because that's just how the market is. But, um, like, there are indie movies. There are, like, YouTube movies. Like, people are making, like, fantastic films, works of, of video and audio and drama on YouTube for free. <laughs> yeah. And, like, well, and it's insane. And that is a complaint that I have, if I may pick a bone for a moment before we get into these nominations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talking about the politics of the industry. I'm so... One of the things that really grinds my gears to hear, and I see this all the time because I watch movie trailers on the regular just to keep up with the industry. Yeah. And so one of the things that always grinds my gears when I see it in the comments is they don't make movies like this anymore. Or I wish they made more movies like the thing is. It's always inevitably on something I watch and it's like it's it's indie, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit more niche in genre or it's like a pure drama or something like yeah. that. And it's like. 
what people don't realize is that they, all, they, whoever they is, yeah. you know, first off, the, the always be skeptical of arguments that rely on the colloquial they is yeah. a yeah. aphorism I've always had. But the colloquial they are still making movies like this. Yeah. Movies like this are constantly coming out. You're just not seeing them marketed because people like you who want to see them aren't watching them. Yeah. And you're not giving them, you're not voting with your dollar enough to make these movies uh, profitable enough to be marketed to a wide audience. Yeah. And so they end up being niche indie films. But if you, if you want to see more of that type of movie, you can, they're all out just there. You just them. have to look for yeah. them. Yeah. Don't wait for one to be delivered to your plate. Go to the restaurant you want to eat at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, that just that just frustrates me a bit because a lot of people don't realize how much the movies they want to see are being made. Yeah. And a lot I, I always hate, the especially are constantly being made, especially for us. We have such a huge love for the action subgenre. Yeah. We have a love for a lot of uh, right, that, I guess that's not a subgenre. That's just the genre. But we have a lot of love for a lot of yeah. genres. We're just genre people. Um, and so. The thing, like, you see that constantly in action movies where they'll be like, oh, yeah, this is like a good old fashioned action. They don't make action movies like this anymore. And it's just like, oh, but they do, though. You're just not watching them. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, like, I remember back when, like, Bruce Lee was making movies like that was a good old times. Like, yeah, Bruce Lee was just making generic Hong Kong films. Go watch Hong Kong films. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You you hear that constant. It's like, oh, yeah. Remember the days of Bruce Lee and Jackie? Ch it's whatever happened to those. It's like they're still they, in Hong Kong. They, they kept they kept Nothing going. Stopped. They kept like, going. Yeah. Like what you're telling me is you literally haven't watched a good action movie since those movies came out. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know they're being made. Like yeah. that was the last good martial arts action movie you watched. Yeah. Was like 40 years ago. Yeah. Like just. uh but that does that, that that's just a literacy problem. Yeah, uh, that is a literacy problem. And it's not it, knowing not yeah, not knowing how to seek yeah. out your palate. Yeah. Um which or, is or, 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 mostly it's not knowing that there are options. That's uh, true. Especially if you if you've been subjected to the box office your entire life for movies. Whatever's on TV, whatever's at the, at the yeah. theater, you're gonna You're at the whims of yeah, yeah, you have the whims powers of, that are not your own. Yeah, yeah, you're at the whims of what would what you assume to be is the market, but what you're actually at uh at the whims of is the corporations like mm. they're the ones who control what you see in box office or be just because they have money they can market it to everybody movies are everywhere just like just stories mm -hmm. movies are one are one form of story and we've been telling stories for forever movies are just one kind they're being made all the time in surprise every country <laughs> <laughs> if the only movies that you've ever seen are american ones that's one country yeah that's literally only one country's industry that you've participated in yeah so anyway that's a side rant we'll close it there otherwise yep. we'll keep ranting um but the point the is first off just watch more indie movies yeah um, also watch more foreign films too oh yeah indie films foreign films anything that's not a uh, studio american film essentially i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> challenge you listener right now actually go watch a movie that isn't in your native language snap son you just made that declaration mm -hmm. but what about the subtitles people are so annoyed who was it uh I think you're thinking Ghibli? about a quote. What? what? Who, who directed Ghibli? Uh, the, or the uh, Miyazaki? Miyazaki. I believe, uh, was it Miyazaki who said, um, like, if you can't get over oh, that. Oh, uh, I was going to say, yeah. So you are thinking of the quote. I was yeah, thinking yeah, okay, of. That yeah. Was, I'm pretty sure that was Bong Joon-ho. Oh, okay, that was Bong Joon-ho. Okay. I'm, I'm fairly certain. Don't quote me on that. I'm not even going to look it up to verify it. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say, I don't know what it is. But yeah, the quote. But I'm uh, going to attribute it to Bong Joon-ho. Sure. Because I'm pretty sure it was more recent after his success with Parasite. That actually makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I think you know the quote better than I do. Uh, it's something to the effect of if you uh, if you can get over the one inch tall barrier of subtitles yeah. uh, to watch a foreign film, then you'll find basically some of the best movies you'll ever see. Yeah. And, <laughs> that, and, uh, make a paraphrase on quotes today. But <laughs> but basically, yeah, like it's it's you, such a small barrier. Well, first of all, uh, we can read faster than we can hear. That can. That is actually just. For most people with less with neurotypical brains, big asterisks, of course. That is that is just how how we work. We can read faster than we can faster than we can hear. But not only that, nope, don't know where I was going with that. That's it. You can read faster than you can hear. It's like it, it's so it's such it's, it's such a minor thing. Also, if it bothers you that much, you. just see if there's a just see if there's a dub. Also, that's true. Like it, uh, the story is gonna mostly remain the same as long as you if you can, if you can get over the fact. That the lips don't match up with the words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the way you have to get over something that yeah. is very petty. <laughs> yeah, it's like if, if you can get over that, it's like, 
whatever. Get yeah. just get over yourself. Just get over yourself. All watch right. watch good movies. All right, Oscars. Oscars. Yeah. What do you want to know about from the Oscars, Lauren? Uh all of it. I haven't heard a dang thing from the Oscars this year. Well, shoot, man. That's a lot of stuff, Lauren. We I don't, don't have time for all of it. <laughs> well, I was talking uh, about Benedict Cumberbatch because yeah. he got nominated for an Oscar for okay. The Power of the Dog, which I'm sl- uh, I'm slowly realizing I think we have to see okay. because I've heard nothing but good things about that movie. I have seen it uh, uh, marketed around, but I also have a very I'm, I'm, I, I interact with marketing interestingly. Yeah, you have a very so, narrow bubble. Yes. Also, because I um, I've turned off all my localization uh, preferences online, so I get worldwide stuff basically right so i have seen that pop around and it does look very interesting i have no idea what it's about me neither um i've watched all the trailers for it (laughs) (laughs) yeah and still have no clue what it's about which i love i'm like yes this is how you market a film i'm i'm interested in it purely on the fact that every time i see it pop up i'm more and more and more confused (laughs) i was like maybe slightly aroused (laughs) (laughs) i i I just don't know what it i don't know anything about it yeah me neither all all i know is i could like get an idea of the setting and the context (laughs) right like from uh from the imagery but other than that all i know is it's a good film and i'm like color palette (laughs) yeah i know it's called exactly you could get a good idea of its color palette its visual presentation but yeah i have no clue about like the subject matter or the themes um but I've heard nothing but good things while it was being marketed. And when I was going uh, watching the trailers, there would always be people who got to see it in festival mm-hmm. in some of the comments who are being like, first off, watch this movie. Uh, second off, I'm not going to say anything more than that <laughs> yeah. because like, it's like nobody festival goers. Are yeah. You that I'm not going to say anything about it. You know, there's going to be, Oh yeah. they like, you know, it's a treat. Yeah. So uh, apparently it's phenomenal. And everybody who got to see it in festival was saying that it, it's hands down, like the best performance of Cumberbatch's career. Oh, so Ooh. That's a that's a pretty a high actor. high bar. Yeah, he's a fantastic actor. So we'll we'll see we'll see. Uh, maybe we ought to watch that one together one of these nights. Sure. Um, Is it on? Uh, it's a Netflix. Uh, it got exclusive distribution on it. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we could access it pretty easily. Okay. Well, well, I'll just go down the actors then while we're here yeah. for actors in a leading role. Uh, Javier Bardem in being the Ricardos. Oh, uh, which is we we, we still got to see. Apparently, he plays that pretty well. Although I hear from people, I don't know too much about Lucy. Um, However, I hear that he doesn't look too much like the guy he's supposed to be portraying. But Mm. 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 but here's one that actually uh, really tickles me. Andrew Garfield in Tick, Tick, Boom. Oh, got nominated for an Oscar, which is weird because I loved that movie. And I can't say I was expecting that to be a nomination. Well, here's the thing. It's a phenomenal performance. Oh, everything about the movie is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's part of the problem. That, maybe that's why I didn't necessarily see that coming as like a performance nomination. Because like literally everything about that movie I enjoyed so much. Here's a, here's a problem with Andrew Garfield being nominated for an Oscar on Tick, Tick, Boom. Is if Tick, Tick, Boom was thematically consistent, it wouldn't have been nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> That is fair. That does seem kind of antithetical to some of its themes. Yeah, just like, like, oh, I'm a struggling artist. You want an Oscar? <laughs> well, but, I mean, that's precisely perhaps why it was nominated then as like Maybe. a sort of reverse psychology. Yeah. The Academy yeah. saying like, oh, we were all starving artists. We know what that's like. When it's just like H- having been born in mansions. <laughs> yeah. So some of these producers are just born in mansions and just like to think of themselves as artists. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it's just like, oh, I identify with your, your soul. And mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, man. Jonathan Larson was a true artist yeah. who lived the life yeah. in New York, no less, where uh, starving artists go to die. <laughs> starving artists live and die. <laughs> where starving artists live and die. New York, New York or L.A. Um, but just the color palette changes depending on which one you're in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one of them slightly more warm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. The other one has harsh, deadly winters. <laughs> yeah. One of them you're going to burn to death and the other one you're going to freeze to death. Yeah, pick, your, like, pick your poison. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I thought that was quite fascinating. I'm not sure when the last time somebody was nominated, uh, for an acting Oscar in a musical, but here we are. Um, but to be fair, he did fantastic. And he, his, yeah, he was his singing is great. Yeah. I was, I was impressed by actually how good of a singer Andrew Garfield is. I knew he was one of those general, like kind of multi-talent people. Yeah. Uh, we don't exactly have triple threats anymore, but uh, you know, he would be of that kind yeah of one of those people who's like talented in the strict sense of the term right yeah. just capable of doing a lot with their uh performance so yeah that that's that's really cool i thought that was neat uh that well, is super good that that's getting more recognition like yeah the, the, for sure the, purely the fact that it's gonna get an oscar not at all 
more people are going to see that and it's going to be that's just good uh will smith in king richard uh, playing the, the another one of his American Dream films, which sure. he, he he does all the time. This time about the uh, Williams uh, sisters. Right. So you 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 actually uh, used to compete in tennis at a pretty yes. high level. So that's I, kind of I interesting. Was, um, yes, I was. Uh, I like to say now that I was semi competitive <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it, you know how it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, as young. a child athlete, it's like, oh, you're gonna do all these competitions. I'm just like, I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If but, I would you say if that I was actually like, if I actually tried i probably could have been decent <laughs> <laughs> what a horrible thing to say <laughs> well i mean I, I wasn't going into these tournaments with any idea of like i'm gonna be like roger federer <laughs> right 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 you were going you weren't there for glory no i was like you know what this is this this tennis thing it's pretty it's pretty fun yeah I, i'll play with people who are good <laughs> that's about it <laughs> yeah would you I, say that was the that was the sport you went furthest in Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, th- that is that is probably the only sport that I can pick up right now and still play and still not be terrible in. <laughs> right. Would you say it was the sport you had the most fun with too? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, like, what about like pure fun factor? I or would you know. say you're more of a basketball guy? Basketball was really fun. Yeah. Basketball is well, also because I'm hella tall. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I, I literally just like put the ball up and nobody can touch it. <laughs> um, but. Oh, basketball is pretty fun, but in terms of in terms of skill, definitely tennis. Um, I think basketball might be. So well, I, I I might have a bias because I made more friends playing basketball, team sport, right? Uh, than I did playing tennis. Right, that's fair. That's fair. I didn't think about it that way. Yeah, I think there's yeah there might be a bias associated with that. And the last actor in a leading role is uh, Denzel Washington for the tragedy of Macbeth. Oh, shockingly, that happened. um, is that just a Macbeth? On. An adaptation? Yes, I was telling you about that. It was the one that's... I don't know these things, right? Yeah, yeah, you I forget, you forget. We had a whole conversation about how I'm not going to remember that. Uh, it was the film I was talking about that is the first film that's directed by only one Cohen brother. Oh, okay, that film, right. Yeah, yeah. Shockingly, Francis McDormand was not uh, nominated for uh, supporting actress, or lead actress, rather, for this film, which was one that was very expected. Hmm. Um, Especially given the fact that this film was essentially made because of her yeah, performance. Yeah, I, I think you told me, like, um, what was it? Uh, well, she, what she happened did, was she, she was she playing... She did a performance? Yeah, she was doing a theater run yeah. of Macbeth, and she invited Joel Cohen to direct the, the play, that, mm-hmm. that production of the play. And he turned it down, but he did later see that production yeah. and and he was like, basically <laughs> yeah but, well basically was uh convinced that he had to share francis mcdormand's performance as lady macbeth yeah. with the world and so that's how that film w- was first conceived mm-hmm. so yeah given that that film was conceived on the strength of her performance it is a bit of a shock that she didn't end up being uh, nominated yeah anyway yeah those are some of the performances uh Belfast, which was remember, I was telling you about that like Irish film right. from uh, yeah, yeah. Kenneth Branagh. Uh, that that actually got racked up quite a few nominations, which is kind of cool to see. It did look pretty good. Mm-hmm. I was gonna ask, um, like, uh, what do you have uh, going on for Best Picture right now? Uh, let me look at the Best Picture list. Best Picture is Belfast. This is the first yeah, one, right? Looks like it's going chronologically, <laughs> <laughs> or rather, uh, alphabetically. Uh, I should alphabetically. say alphabetically. Belfast, Coda, which is one that I don't actually know. I think it's a foreign film. About uh, with a K or the C, C O D A. The name references uh, a real thing that I'm struggling to remember right now, but I uh, looked it up once. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the one that kind of went under my radar. Uh, Belfast, Coda, Don't Look Up, mm-hmm. Drive My Car, uh, which is another foreign film that went under my radar. That mm-hmm. one um, is a Japanese picture. Uh huh. So, which is very fascinating. I don't know when the last time mm-hmm. we saw. Japanese cinema at the Oscars was. Uh, Koda is an acronym for Child of Deaf Adults. That's what it is. Yeah, um, which is fascinating because I'm pretty much I'm pretty sure in that one, like the subject, the character is a child of deaf parents who is not themselves deaf. Yeah, uh, which is, must be a that's a very fascinating, I suppose, sort of situation and dynamic that I had never before considered. Which is kind of the point of art is to show you things yeah. you hadn't before yeah. considered and kind of give you that window into empathy let me just uh speed run the best picture nominees belfast coda don't look up drive my car right. dune of course. naturally king richard licorice pizza what? nightmare alley 
The Power of the Dog and West Side Story. Three or four of those films I don't know. <laughs> Licorice Pizza was uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's new picture. Uh, he uh, that's the guy who directed There Will Be Blood okay, and yeah. uh, a number of other films. I'm uh, I oh he also did uh, The Master um, films like Ooh. that. Yeah, so he's he's kind of I still need to see that one. Yeah, I showed you the one clip of it. Yeah, because no, you're really you're excited. you're very interested in cults and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think it's I think that film would be way up your alley. Uh, but his films are yeah very artsy and very kind of long form. It's but what's special about Licorice Pizza is that it uh, stars the son of Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was a frequent collaborator right. with Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. And so people were saying, like, it is kind of a touching thing to see this director working with the son of his most trusted collaborator. Yeah. Uh, for, to kind of continue that, that legacy. But this is, I'm pretty sure his first acting job. Oh. So, and he's playing like the lead role in this like coming of age film. So uh, that's a very fascinating setup. I'm honestly surprised by how much nightmare alley yeah, what, there what, is what, on here. That's the uh, Guillermo del Toro's new piece. Ooh. Uh, and it looks, it looks very fascinating, but I mean, when does GDD ever disappoint? Yeah. Uh, uh, Guillermo del, del Toro. <laughs> Did you just call him Totoro? <laughs> Apparently, that's what. Um, what movie was he working on? Uh, he had a Japanese actress who couldn't pronounce his name, and he gave her permission to call him Totoro. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, I think he gave her permission to call her Totoro, or call him Totoro, because he couldn't pronounce his name. <laughs> wow, that's hilarious, or something like that. But yeah, yeah, lots of lots of interesting things. Um, oh yeah, I totally forgot too that Encanto was technically released last year, so it did. That oh. was up for a lot of nominations. Two obviously animated feature films. Of course, of course. Um, as well as best song. Guess which song from Encanto was nominated for best song? You didn't talk about Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think they specifically didn't choose that to <laughs> emphasize the fact that oh, we're not a popularity contest. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So if it wasn't, we don't talk about Bruno. Um, it would be um, surface pressure. Nope. Oh, let's see then. You're not thinking like an artist, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm thinking like if if I'm not thinking like, like an artist, then it would be um, uh, Isabella's song. No, not that one either. Really? Yeah. There's only five songs in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there aren't that many songs, but maybe you'll be surprised, or maybe you won't be surprised. Yeah. I think as soon as I say it, you're not going to be surprised. Familia Madrigal. <laughs> Dos Origitas. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That was actually what do you call that? Like. Yeah, that's true, because Dos Origitas, uh is a song that was by, like, obviously I'm not uh, in the Latin community culture, unfortunately, being Latin, but apparently he's a massive, the guy who, who recorded it is a massive like, oh, the, pop star. The, in, the singer? Yeah. Oh, He's a massive pop star in, like, well, in, in Colombia. He's a Colombian singer. Uh, what's his name? Who directed it? Or who did the music? Uh, Lin-Manuel. Uh, yeah, so, and Lin-Manuel, uh, he specifically wanted to get, like, you know, a, yeah. a, a Colombian singer to do that song mm -hmm. because it's I mean it's such, it's such a, a it, is, it, it, it is the thesis statement of the film and it's such yeah it's a, such an important piece yeah. of music not well, especially in the context of the story yeah. like it is a huge narrative beat and it's also just a really touching song and yeah. like uh, I watched a small feature on Lin-Manuel Miranda talking about the the development of the music mm -hmm. and yeah it's it, it's true this one i mean this could like be seen as you know blowing your own horn when you're uh he's talking a, about he's yourself to. yeah he's kind of allowed to at this point but i have to agree it's like it's one it's a song that even though it is the one like purely spanish song mm -hmm. in the soundtrack right yeah. it's the only one that has no english in it whatsoever uh at least i think they do an english version in the credits yeah the credits but, has um, uh, same singer doing an english version oh really yeah uh and uh so i looked it up apparently it's better translated to fit English. That's not like a direct translation. It's straight up two different songs that have oh, the same message. Oh, I see, yeah. I see. But yeah, in the case of the proper song, the- yeah. uh, Dos Orguitas, as yeah, opposed to Dos Orguitas, Orguitas. That even though it is in a different language, even if you don't speak that language fluently, like myself, the emotional impact still comes across yeah. so clearly. And it's just that whole montage from that film just- it, 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 it genuinely made me cry both times I watched that Absolutely, film. absolutely. Uh, two Orgitas, the English version, um, I didn't get to like, properly listen to until I listened to the soundtrack because you know, it's, during the, it's during the credits, I think we were talking and all this other stuff. I, I, at one point, I think the first time we watched the film, I was like, oh wait, it's that one song, but in English. And then we kept talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, once I started listening to the soundtrack, 
that easily became my favorite song from the from the soundtrack from, from the film. The English easily. version. The English version. Oh, really? And uh, just I, I want to say this as a piece of like songwriting, brilliant piece of uh, uh, like, I don't know. It's not trivia because it's, it's the lyrics. You don't get if you don't speak Spanish or if you, you don't l- look at the lyrics. There's two halves of that song. Two oruguitas, two caterpillars, and then uh, two mariposas, which is two butterflies at the mm. end of the song. It literally, the song evolves with the, the creatures as it, as it goes on. Right. It's like it's, there's two different halves. Like once it starts to get swelling and having that like big yeah. payoff, it, so switches to, it switches from two caterpillars to two butterflies. Yeah, so there's compositional payoff. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Just, I love Ooh. that song. It's really good. And also butterflies as a, a recurring motif throughout the entire film. Yes, yes. That is the thing that uh, is in there. Bo- yeah, both. To talk about this film a lot. Uh, we have been talking about this film a lot. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize this because obviously it's more obvious on um, Mirabelle. She's got the flower or the uh, butterfly embroidered on her dress. But also... Um, I don't remember Abuelita's name, but she also has a butterfly on her dress. Yes. I yeah. didn't notice that until the second time I watched it. Yeah, I didn't notice that actually until it was pointed out to me. The, yeah. the second one, obviously, I noticed Mirabelle because yeah, that one's yeah. very it's emphasized. A little bit more, yeah. it, it's a little bit more obvious, yeah, but that Abuela does uh, have, have one as well. So, yeah, I guess any other categories you want to look at while uh, I have it up? Let me think. That's, that's pretty much it. There's Best picture is, I guess, really the only thing I'm too interested in oh snap the mitchells versus the machines was last year too that was oh snap i'm not sure who's gonna win now (laughs) (laughs) what is that for um animated animated feature film uh oh that's good yeah the lost daughter also got a lot of nods which i heard a lot of great things about that film yeah that's a film by maggie gyllenhaal um yeah and yeah apparently has some really strong performances in it Mm -hmm. uh Olivia Coleman, of course, was nominated for actress in a leading role for that one. Oh, Jessica Chastain in The Eyes of Tammy Faye. That's a film I actually want to see because that kind of deals with a subject matter that is very much up my alley, which is uh, the sort of rise of the religious right and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, literally, Vincent D'Onofrio is playing Jerry Falwell in that film. So <laughs> that's like, I'm like, OK, yeah, this is this is a very fascinating subject matter. But yeah, it stars Jessica Chastain and uh, Andrew Garfield. Uh, he was in like five movies last year, by oh, the geez. way. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> uh, he, but it, uh, as like the, these, um, this pastor of this mega church and his uh-huh. wife, uh, his wife, Tammy Faye, uh-huh. and um, who I think they were like a, basically a prosperity mega church. Of course. Uh, that had like a huge uh, place in the rising religious right at that time where you start to see evangelicalism come onto the scene as a big political force. Uh-huh. Also, this, the, and, this is like... Uh, Back in oh yeah, this is back in the day. This is Jerry Falwell day. Senior we're talking about. Okay, uh, who was kind of one of the the early celebrities of uh, the religious right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Jessica Chastain is I would say transformative, but just like transformed <laughs> in that role. Like it, I watched uh, so many of the trailers for it, and she is completely unrecognizable. Mm-hmm. Like you can't even tell that that's Jessica Chastain. I, I'm sure a lot of it is like makeup and hairstyling and all that. Uh, I think that film was also nominated in that department. Uh-huh. But yeah, you just she cannot be recognized. Like <laughs> looks, sounds and just behaves nothing like what you would expect of Jessica Chastain. Mm. It's incredible. Is it like um, Christian Bale vice levels of transformed? <laughs> it could be. I don't know. I don't know how much of a body transformation it was, but. So I have recently seen Christian Bale in Vice and like, oh, yeah, I didn't even as Dick Cheney. Oh, here's oh, here's the thing. I, I, I saw the clips of Vice and then was reminded after that that was Christian Bale's like, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> I didn't know that was him. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, just crazy what that person can do with his body. Yeah, absolutely insane. And of course, the one I, I suppose this is one I forgot to talk about of movies that we didn't get to see last year on our last podcast. Oh. We uh, had that brief conversation. I told I think I totally neg- neglected to talk about Spencer, but obviously there's the kind of favored to win actress in a leading role is Kristen Stewart in Spencer, where mm. she plays uh, Princess Diana. That, oh, right. Yeah, that right, right, right. performance looks absolutely insane. She really embodied that role. And apparently it is just an incredible film and uh, an incredible embodiment of the historic person. Yeah. Um, and Kristen Stewart 
Whew. I guess she, she's going to possibly get her due after having to do so much Twilight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like all the, all those Twilight alumni are just going to be like, remember, we're, we're real actors. We're real actors. We're real I mean, actors. Robert Pattinson has been trying really hard to remind us that he's a real actor. Right. <laughs> I, 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 well, I think Lighthouse was the first movie that I saw him in since Twilight. <laughs> I was like, yeah, OK, I get it. You're, yeah, you're an I actor. get it. You're an actor. I, I, I Wait, no, I no. Just... We saw. Good time first. The oh, Safety right. Brothers yeah. movie. Yeah. That's true. That was a good movie. That was a good it movie. Was a surprisingly good movie. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why it was. I don't know why, but it was, <laughs> it was a surprisingly good movie. I don't have to understand it to like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that describes the Safety Brothers movies generally. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> it's just good. Yeah. Like, like this it's is fantastic. I'm having a good time, but what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're, they are very particular kinds of filmmakers, aren't they? Oh, you know what? They don't make films like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at least we actually watched it. Yeah. Now, well, and that's what fascinated me, too. I'm not sure if you picked up on that, because uh, I thought one of the interesting things about Good Time was that I think their portrayal of the gritty uh, streets was mm-hmm. very reminiscent of like old school Scorsese to me. Oh, yeah. And I was very fascinated to notice that Scorsese produced their second picture, um, uh, Uncut Gems. Oh, did you, that that? did you notice that Martin Scorsese was an executive producer on that nope. film? I noticed <laughs> that during the opening credits. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, I was just thinking about how the Safdie brothers <laughs> <laughs> portrayal of the streets kind of reminds me of old school Martin Scorsese. Right. <laughs> so it turns out he must have thought so, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. That's our brief foray into the Oscars. Obviously, yeah. lots of Dune stuff, um, I, which I still need to finish that book and then see. <laughs> I, need, I need you to finish that book so that when you see it, you can tell me. <laughs> yeah, I can explain everything. Can, yeah, I need you to explain this, uh, this movie to me, Raf. Um, because, yeah, Denis Villeneuve is awesome. And uh, I'm really excited to see what he does with that adaptation, even though I'll be the last person in the world to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, yeah, some stuff for... Uh, obviously, the song from No Time to Die, every time a Bond song comes out, right. gotta, yep. it's going to get nominated for the uh, Best Original Song. Do you know who did the song this time? Billie Eilish. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's fascinating. So anyway. I'm a very casual fan of Billie Eilish. <laughs> very casual. <laughs> yeah. Very sort of peripheral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, there's a whole lot of stuff we didn't get to talk about, but I think we have to wind things down yeah. because... That was our... Uh a little topic for, for the day. Yeah, that was, that was our topic. It, it, so it we didn't get, being a whole thing. <laughs> we didn't end up getting to do a segment because we've gone a little over, but that's okay. We're just going to wind things down here yep. and we'll have plenty to talk about next time. Oh, definitely. Thank you all very much for listening. Uh, this show is mixed and edited by Rafael Pacheco with theme music by Mono Memory. And until next time, we'll see you all later. Bye. We need to we need close out. We need to figure <laughs> out this outro business stat. Yeah.